Hello and welcome to Hiblio TV. My name is Paul Norris and I'm your host for tonight's conversation. If this is the first time you've joined us, welcome. And if you're back for more, it's great to see you. If you're confused about the difference between psychiatry and psychology, you're not alone. Tonight we find out more about the role of a psychiatrist and the conditions they treat. Joining me in the studio to talk about psychiatry is Kate Lovett and Tom Can, and it's a pleasure to welcome to the studio. Welcome. Thank you, Paul. Um, if you'd like to start by just giving our viewers a bit of background about yourself. Okay, thank you, Paul. It's absolute um, pleasure to be back here on the Hiblio uh, couch again with my, my colleague uh, Tom Kant. My name's Kate Lovett. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, I've been a psychiatrist now for 15 years, and I work in the Newton Abbott area of Devon with adults of uh, working age. Great. Right, and, and lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank Paul, you very much, Tom, for having me. And um, I'm a consultant psychiatrist based here in Torbay Hospital on the inpatient unit. I've only been a consultant for four years, um, uh, but been based in the southwest throughout my training. Great, great, real pleasure. So, Kate, if we can just uh, start off, then, what is a psychiatrist? Okay, so a psychiatrist. Just let's get that confusion right out. Yeah, sure. So, a psychiatrist is a doctor who has specialised in looking after people with mental health uh, conditions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how does a psychiatrist differ from the psychologist? Okay, so that's a question that, that I'm frequently asked, uh, Paul. So a psychologist is um, someone who's studied extensively the science of brain functioning and human behaviour. Uh, and then they've gone on to do uh, further training uh, and develop expertise in talking therapies. So psychiatrists and psychologists work very closely together. Mm. Um, and I should have said that there are you know, many different types of psychologists. So the type of psychologist we're talking about are clinical psychologists that would work with mental health uh, teams. So psychiatrists and psychologists have complementary roles. Sometimes they have uh, overlapping uh, roles. Uh, uh, and um, psychiatrists you know, uh, do things like they can prescribe medication whereas a psychologist uh, wouldn't be able to prescribe uh, medication. Psychiatrists also have a medical background, so they're able to examine and, and, and make diagnoses. Uh, and they've also um, had some uh, training in psychological therapies uh, as they've been training a psychiatrist and sometimes have gone on to develop particular expertise in, in different uh, uh, areas of, of talking therapies. So that all sounds ex extensive, that yeah. routine of Absolutely. starting off on your doctor training and then branching off. That's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, I know we had a little uh, conversation about this, yes. you know, Christmas parties and weddings. Do people make a beeline for you or do they avoid? <laughs> well, I think, you know, Tom's going to come on and talk a little bit about stigma uh, yes. later on. Uh, but yes, it, you know, sometimes people can be quite frightened at, at the idea of, of, of psychiatry for a whole variety mm. of, of reasons. And sometimes people, you know, are delighted to talk to us at parties. So, so, so responses vary. Great. So, Tom, what led uh, you to specialise in psychiatry? Well, I finished medical school, the, the, the grounding in, uh, to study, uh, studying medicine to, to qualify as a doctor. I then went on to do the, the house jobs of medicine and surgery and then into accident and emergency. And then the sort of demonstration of profound lack of understanding of my own, uh, my own interests, I thought I was going to be an anaesthetist. So really only working with people who weren't going to be involved in any sort of um, long in exploratory conversations with me at that stage. But through working in an A&E department, I discovered the people who, who are most excited to be um, involved in mm. supporting and caring for were, in fact, people coming in with psychiatric problems. And as I, as I was working within the A&E department and then going on to psychiatric training, I really sort of found myself enjoying the opportunity to really take a more of a holistic approach to understanding people and their context and their, their broad, broader social environment that had led them to suffer the difficulties that brought them into your, your company and seeking your help at that point that day. So it, it feels that to me like a specialty which, which not only encompasses, we might say later on, as the biological aspects of, of disease and illness, but also thinking more about psychology and then the wider context of people within society as a whole. So I'd say that that's what led me to, to, I think, to be more interested in the psychiatric domain. And practicing psychiatry is, is, um, is, a, is a real pleasure in as far as it remains one of the specialties that's primarily um, based on eliciting symptoms and signs through interview and the clinical skills that you need to, 
to develop an understanding of a person, their context, their difficulties and their suffering, and then put them into patterns that might be recognisable to understand how to develop a diagnosis and then with them an approach to take to resolving some of their issues is uh, in psychiatry almost entirely based on that interview, not, not, mm. not so much as you may find in other medical specialties on investigations. And, and uh, so that for me is very, very important, that, that contact, that interaction with the person being so key. And, and psychiatry is such a, still such an area that, that has so much uncertainty. We perhaps might be regarded as where perhaps cardiology was back in the middle of the 19th century. We've, we've, we've got diagnoses which are really still just shorthand for, uh, for clusters of symptoms. Oh. And we are only really starting to get a, a deeper understanding of what the, uh, the core psychopathological or the core problems people are suffering that develop these disorders. Um, we're really only in our infancy in that respect. And it's quite interesting that you say that because people are very complex, you know, that they might come and visit you and they might not immediately open up. Mm. So, you know, that questioning to get help people feel at ease, to get that information so you can make that. So what does your current job involve then, Tom, on a day-to-day? Well, I'm, I as I said, I work on the inpatient unit here at Torbay Hospital. So I, I'm, I work with um, individuals who have to be admitted to, to hospital to receive the care and support that they need, usually as a result of um, concerns about their safety. And, um, and, uh, and that might be in terms of their ability to, to look after themselves safely in the community or their vulnerability to, to having accidents or being exploited by people around or the risk of, of um, taking steps to harm themselves yeah. or, or to take their lives. In, in that context, we w- work within um, um, a, a model with sometimes referred to as the medical model, which is uh, we refer to as having biopsychosocial aspects. So um, in terms of both understanding the patient's problems and the, and the person's difficulties, and also in developing a management plan, we think about biological steps we could take. So we might think about um, genetic risk that they may suffer, for example, and then medication within a biological um, framework, how that may help them. Psychologically, how psychological difficulties may have led to the problems that they've got and what psychological interventions we might um, use to alleviate their suffering. And then also to understand the social context in which their problems have evolved. And then what, what's, what interventions in a social sphere, be that employment or their accommodation or connection to social group and, and their wider um, uh, social setting, families and the, their importance, uh-huh. um, can also be part of what we do within an inpatient setting to try and um, support that person's recovery. So you mentioned there, and I'll pick you up on that because our viewers may not be that familiar, around you know, a bit more about urgent and inpatient services. Can you just help us, our audience, with that? Well, the, the differences. Well, inpatient services, um, uh, you will have a, a, a acute hospitals, okay. so inpatient wards, yeah. uh, and they're usually supported by um, crisis and home treatment teams, which right. seek to, at some at some level to to um, prevent people having to have periods of time in hospital and, and try and support and provide treatment within the within a community setting at home in the context of their families and carers. Um, we've also got um, psychiatry services that are related to the general hospital, liaison psychiatry services, and, and they will also be performing a very similar function trying to support people's psychiatric need within a hospital setting. Right, okay. Um, and then um, within inpatient services, there are, there are various other manifestations of inpatient psychiatry services which would care for perhaps people with more specific needs, whether they be people who have um, um, very agitated or potentially violent behaviour, requiring psychiatric intensive care, or people who um, have criminal behaviour linked to their psychiatric illness, and then you might think about forensic hospital units at different levels of security. I work in general adult inpatient units, where um, people are uh, free to come and go, given support from the nursing staff and assessment to make sure that that's safe to happen. So people, people we hope for, can use the hospital facility, but both be still connected to their their communities. Right. So you're all hospital base, Kate. You're in the community. That's right. When might someone be referred to a psychiatrist? Okay. So I think it's important to say that GPs look after the vast majority of. 
uh, people with mental health uh, problems uh, and have expertise in uh, treating the common mental uh, conditions such as anxiety and depression. But sometimes uh, they would refer on to uh, specialist community mental health teams. So the situations that might happen uh, in would be if somebody wasn't responding to treatment, uh, if initial uh, treatment wasn't working, or if their situation was quite complex. So if somebody, for example, had more than one uh, mental health uh, problem or they had physical health problems that were complicating the picture and, and, and the person's presentation. Just going back a bit, it's important to say that you know GPs will offer treatment for the common mental disorders. They sometimes may refer people on to primary care uh, talking therapies. So uh, depending on in which part of the country you live in, some places those are called IAPT services or improving access to psychological therapies. In Devon we call it the depression and anxiety uh, service. So uh, people can have um, you know, uh, basic talking therapies uh, to help them within primary care. Um, but they would refer on to secondary or to, to uh, specialist mental health services uh, if, the, you know, as I say, they're not responding, uh, if they're complex sort of situations, mm. or if the GP is concerned about risk. So uh, if somebody, uh, for example, is at risk of uh, neglecting themselves because of their mental health problems, or at risk of uh, self-harm, as Tom sort of mentioned uh, before, or indeed the severity of their symptoms. You know, they might need to involve the crisis team uh, because of severity of, 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 of symptoms. So the GP being primary there, so yeah. I can imagine coming back around the apprehension yes, yes. of actually being referred to a psychiatrist yes, yes. and that resistance, but yes. actually it's going to be good for me. Um, I think it's just around the name, you know, old, old. Mm history of that, what should someone expect if they are referred? Okay, so I think the first thing to say is that psychiatrists like people come in all shapes and sizes. Um, but what we have in common is an expertise around diagnosis and treatment of, of uh, mental health uh, conditions. Mm. And the other thing that we have in common is to recognise our own expertise, but recognise that the patient is an expert themselves in what they're currently going through and in what things have helped them in the past. So we want to work very collaboratively um, together with, with the person referred to us to explore their difficulties and come up with a plan that was acceptable to the patient um, and that they felt was going to be helpful. So, you know, what would we want to, to do? Well, we first of all, like you mentioned before, we want to put people at their ease. We want to gain their uh, trust. Um, and gently question them in some detail about what the current difficulties are uh, and factors that may have led them to the current sort of situation. Like all medical consultations, seeing a psychiatrist is confidential yes. and that's really important that people recognise that, that you know, what's said to the psychiatrist, uh, there are rules of confidentiality around that just like with every medical com uh, conversation. And the other thing is that um, sometimes people really worry about uh, aspects of their life, things that they're concerned about or things that they may feel ashamed about. Uh, and uh, psychiatrists are trained not to judge people. So we're trained to listen to people and accept what they're saying without any kind of oh. judgment. So should, people should feel uh, reassured about that. Um, they might see us as a one-off appointment. Uh, or we might work with them a bit longer term mm. with a, a, a team of different uh, professionals around them, so psychologists, uh, community psychiatric nurses, occupational therapies, th therapists, social workers and, and, and so on, support workers. Because you do hear, you know, a lot is in the press, people have bad childhoods and stuff happens and yes. they, some people live with that, some people lock it away yeah. for a long time and then they reach their th late 30s and yeah, 40s yeah, and yeah, something yeah. happens. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, and it, it, it can be painful for people yes. to have that kind of flashback into their lives. So, Tom, if people are worried about disclosing, you know, their, their mm. worries about their mental health, you know, that could be... What would you say to them? Well, I think my experience, akin to my experience of exercise, the most difficult bit for me is actually putting the shorts on. And perhaps the most difficult bit about taking that getting involved in trying to understand how to support yourself and how to seek and gain the support you need mm. is perhaps going to be taking that first step and actually 
and looking for help and actually talking to somebody. Now, whether that be a professional or whether that be a, a trusted friend or family member, in a sense, almost perhaps that first step, who that is, doesn't really matter. But talking to somebody and, and starting that process is, 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 uh, is what I would say to somebody is the most important um, thing they need to be doing. And uh, it is understandable that it would be a, a very challenging, very frightening experience to be doing that. And oh. when you're thinking that our minds are responsible for, on a moment-to-moment on -moment basis, of constructing our reality. And if your mind is not um, uh, functioning in a way that you're familiar with or that you're, or you're comfortable with, your reality is very much threatened. An incredibly uh, distressing and, and challenging experience in itself. And, uh, and, a real, and people really uh, feel a real loss of, a loss of control, being very, very um, palpable and very important in that, that sense of fear that they develop. Now, society in general, when perhaps our response to that fear about mental illness, and we've already okay, briefly yeah, mentioning that stigma, stigma yeah. that develops about that, and perhaps that's society's response to, to some level in, in protecting itself and trying to distance itself from, from these frightening experiences. And humour can be another way of... Uh, we try and manage uh, difficult and challenging experiences. So around stigma and there's humour and you, you, uh, the sort of comedy around mental illness itself can also feed into that the development of shame for that individual about that sense of there's something very wrong with me rather than I'm I'm suffering an illness that this is a very personal um, defect or deficit within within them and then that temptation to isolate themselves from. Um, from from individuals who might otherwise be able to provide them with support is is even more encouraged and it's isolation itself is interesting because it, it goes both ways both being a um, being socially isolated as as a risk factor for developing um, a mental disorder or mental distress but also in, in the other respect in terms of um, people who have suffered mental disorders can then find themselves becoming increasingly isolated both through the process of the illness itself but also society's response to that and, and the fear and stigma and shame that I've briefly described. So I'd say sharing this with, in some way, mm -hmm. in a safe way with people sharing that, the commonality of that experience. That mental disorder, mental distress is an extremely common experience for people. Um, and, and then finding whether that, that support from other people who have had common experiences or getting specific help from professionals. As, as Kate has said, actually psychiatrists only see really a very small number of people in comparison to the number of people support and help oh. by GPs can then take place. But not going it alone. No, and, and it's really nice to hear that, you know, there's been national campaigns about that power of talking, mm. you know, and overcoming that vulnerability and actually sharing and where those conversations can happen. They can just happen at a photocopy or, or, or in the shopping centre and how are you? Mm. And it just opens that, that dialogue that may lead you to then seeking further Absolutely. help. I think that's, there's so much power in that. Mm. Um, so your job sounds really interesting. I think I missed my vocation because I think I want to come across. <laughs> and varied. How would someone go about training to be a psychiatrist, okay. Kate? Well, thanks, Paul. I mean, it's an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, job. And, um, you know, I have no regrets about sort of my career path. It's been an absolute privilege to do the job that I do. So if somebody out there is interested in, in being a psychiatrist, uh, you need to go off and do a medical degree, so uh, do an undergraduate medical degree at university. That takes about five years. Uh, do I need to get average. my jotter out now? Okay, that's five years. <laughs> five okay. years, okay. Uh, and then following um, qualifying as a, as, as a doctor, uh, people would then apply to do a foundation rotation for two years. So that's kind of consolidating uh, basic medical skills, so people would rotate through various specialties, you know, obs and gynae, paediatrics, surgery, medicine, psychiatry. Uh, uh, the, the whole range of uh, specialty and at the end of those two years that's when people are in a position uh, as doctors to apply to do specialist training so they'd go and uh, apply to, to specialise in general practice or surgery or, or whatever so at that stage people apply to become psychiatrists they undergo a competitive uh, interview uh, and join if, if they're successful a three year core training rotation okay. and during that that period of time they rotate through different special subspecialties of psychiatry they have intensive uh, educational and clinical supervision and during that part time they sit postgraduate exams so uh, membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists so the idea is that through that three years they uh, 
successfully pass membership exam, they become a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, and that's very exciting because that's the time, isn't it, Tom, that, that you're allowed to call yourself a psychiatrist. Right. But the, the journey's not quite over uh, then. So then uh, uh, people finish that rotation. They then apply to uh, specialise further in one of the six subspecialties of psychiatry and do a further three years. So the, 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 the areas of subspecialty are uh, child psychiatry, psychotherapy, learning disability psychiatry, uh, forensic uh, general psychiatry and old age uh, psychiatry. And at that stage, let's have jumped those hoops, they apply to become a consultant um, psychiatrist. So I've just done my maths. I feel like I'm on one of those game shows, shows yep. <laughs> that are on prime time at 5.30. <laughs> so that's 13 years 13 to become a years. consultant. Yeah, yeah. It sounds fairly horrendous, doesn't yeah. it? Um, I think the thing to bear in mind, though, that for eight of those years, uh, people are working as junior doctors in the health service. Oh. Uh, they're working as part of teams, they're seeing patients and making a massive contribution uh, to patient care. I mean, our, our, we really value our junior doctors and the contribution they make to our, our, our teams in, in psychiatry. Uh, they're also earning a salary during that time as well, and they're studying. So the studying bit sounds, sounds quite, quite worrying and hard as well, and it is um, much challenge there. But what we get to study as psychiatrists is the brain which in my view is the most interesting organ in the human body uh, and certainly the most complicated. Mm. But also a broad range of other sort of academic subjects as well. So, you know, philosophy comes into what we do, ethics comes into it, law comes into it, a lot of politics comes into it. We were talking about stigma before and, and you know, part of our role as psychiatrists is to be advocates for our patients and to, to stand up and, and be counted when, you know, things are un, unjust. So. It's hard work, but it's really, really interesting. And the other fantastic thing is that, you know, we get to be alongside people. So mm. I think that there's no greater pleasure, uh, you know, professionally than seeing somebody, you know, being with them when they're really unwell. In the dark days, yeah. In the dark days, yeah. in the really tough times. Um, being alongside somebody and then you know being part of the journey the uh, when they're recovering yeah. um, you know it's absolute privilege uh, and we see people get better day on day out uh, and that's that's just brilliant so I'd say to young people oh, this is your call to the camera okay absolutely. okay <laughs> so I say to young people out there that are interested you know if you're interested in science mm. if you're absolutely fascinated by uh, people and you want to do a job that you know makes a difference choose psychiatry Fabulous. I think we're going to end on that. Thank you very much. Um, my thanks to Kate and Tom for joining me tonight and giving us a real insight into the world of psychiatry. For further information about a career, please follow the links accompanying this broadcast. I'm Paul Norris. This is Hiblio.tv and thanks for watching.